by putting it in at eight. I'm percentage. happy to welcome you to the Very tonight's meeting of sorry. the um, measure, the Joint so, Committee to Implement Measure 91. It's May 18th, uh, and and I'm really happy that we could all be here. Um, that's what we're looking at doing. In the lead up, in the lead up to this meeting, I was talking to a friend, and he said to me. If you like laws or if you like sausage, it's probably best not to see either one of them getting made. <laughs> and that's certainly true from the last week or two of, of this committee's life. But if you have to be up close and personal and seeing them get made, it's definitely best to really care about the people who are going to be affected by the laws and the policies that you're making. And I think that that is true of everyone on this dais right now and co-chair Burdick. And for all that it's, it's a, a funny twist of events that we've gone through, I feel 100 percent confident that everyone who's engaged in the Joint Committee to implement Measure 91 sincerely is going to work together hard and diligently and in good faith to try to put together a good um, Measure 91 bill. So with that, welcome to the meeting. And we're really happy to have all of you there and all of us here. And we wish Co-Chair Burdick a speedy recovery on her, uh, her sickness. We have an exciting thing that we get to do tonight. After many months of working, uh, each of us in different efforts and uh, a lot of teamwork and collaboration and bipartisan work, um, we are getting to unveil the framework for a, what? A Measure 91 implementation bill. Who'd have thought? <laughs> so it is our pleasure to have uh, Mark Mayer come back to the dais tonight and walk us through uh, the Dash 1 amendment to House Bill 3400. It's a whole new thing from the last time we uh, considered House Bill 3400. And you'll see in it, and I think the, the members of the committee will see in it a lot of things that they worked on and a lot of things that they recognize. So it's a good starting place for conversation. But to be clear, it's just a starting place. And we value your input. And we want to have plenty of public hearings on this and uh, opportunities to trade ideas and thoughts and get to something we can all feel good about. OK, with that, Mr. Mayor, if you'd be so kind, um, I will officially open an informational session and invite you to state your name for the record and kick us off. Um, Chair Leininger, members of the committee, Mark Mayor, Legislative Council. I'm here to walk through the Dash 1 amendments to House Bill 3400, which has become the vehicle for uh, the Measure 91 bill. Um, the, the amendment is loosely divided up into um, several different sections. I think I'll probably just briefly address each of those sections uh, before moving on to a more detailed analysis of each one. The first part of the bill, pages 1 through 36, are substantive changes to Measure 91 itself. Those provisions, many of them have been seen before um, during the testimony of Tom Burns for the, and uh, Patridge of the OLCC for the technical fix bill. Um, and a lot of them have remained relatively unchanged since that time. A lot of them have been tweaked uh, at the request of members. Um, there are also some substantive provisions that have been requested by members. Um, pages 36 through 52 are merely technical fixes for the most part um, that merely update references in Measure 91 for purposes of codification, as well as the minimum number of uh, tweaks that our office had to make in order to make it comport with legislative form and style. We try to be very careful with those sections since there was, the intent was not to make any substantive <coughs> changes there. Uh, pages 52 through, I, I did have a copy that was tabulated and I left it in my office. Pages 52 through 72 are point of sale taxation. They also include some fixes to Measure 91 uh, revolving around uh, some of the carve outs for the income tax code and things like that. A lot of technical details there that I probably won't have enough time to get into tonight, um, but I will talk about the point of sale taxation piece when we get to that point. Uh, page 72 through 
page 80 is the testing component. This language has remained largely unchanged from the amended language that was originally in Senate Bill 844-6 amendments. The only changes are that we removed references to processing sites. And the reason that we removed those references is that we do not know whether or not um, a version of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act bill will pass, so we removed those references. I also want to clarify that we do have a repealer in here that if either of the vehicles for the testing and packaging sections does become law that are out there, uh, Senate Bill 844, Senate Bill 996, <coughs> Uh, the testing and packaging sections in this bill will be repealed and those other sections that have references to the processing sites will take effect. So we have done that. Uh, page 80, as I've alluded to, through page 86, again, is packaging and labeling, which is something that this committee has already seen, embedded, and looked at and gotten response on. The language, again, is largely unchanged from the amended versions of the Dash 6 amendments to Senate Bill 844. Page 86 through 90 is another program that is supposed to be a program that operates for both systems. It's a, we're calling it loosely in the title nurseries, but it's really about propagation of immature marijuana plants and seeds. And it's a program to help establish the system and to allow seeds and starts to be sold or transferred into either the medical program or into the recreational program. Um, the nursery section does not allow for sales to consumers or and does not allow for transfer or sales of mature marijuana plants. I just want to highlight that very quickly. On page 90, we have the research certification. On page 91, the intent is to adjust the crimes in Measure 91. Uh, excuse me, the current crimes related to manufacturing, delivery, or possession of marijuana. I'll talk more specifically about those as we get to that point. Page 101, retail drug outlets, which was, again, part of the Dash one amendments to Senate Bill 844. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that if we have time. It's a very minor adjustment. And then finally, temporary provisions, repeals, series placement, operative dates, and the other type of miscellaneous stuff at the end. So that's the basic framework. Those are the major provisions. Um, I think we'll probably spend most of our time in the front matter. And please just interrupt me as I go along and explain what the different provisions do. And I'm just going to, if we've already seen it before, I'm just going to make a note that, you know, this was in the Dash 1 amendments to Senate Bill 844. And if you have any comments on it, you can interrupt me, please, but I'll probably just go right through it. So um, Section 1 definitions. Again, as I mentioned earlier when uh, with Senator Przanski asked me at the last committee hearing, um, the intent was to align the definitions as closely as possible to those that were vetted and agreed to for the OHA bill and to use similar terminology and similar uh, language throughout. So we've done that to the best of our ability. And again, I did miss the marijuana, mature marijuana plant language. Um, but I think that the correct thing to do is to fix that in 936, not in Measure 91, because we also have a potential number cap for mature plants in this bill. So. These definitions have been looked at and vetted, um, and very little else has changed since the Dash 1 amendments to 844. Powers and duties of commission on page 7, section 2. Again, this language was looked at in Senate Bill 844-1 amendments. The only change is that the fees that are being collected for purposes other than application, licensing, and renewal fees um, underneath this section are now going to be going into a fund that we're establishing for purposes of helping to administer and enforce the act. Uh, standard boilerplate language are funneling all the fee monies into uh, a separate fund to make it so that they pay for the act itself up front. On page 10, power to purchase, possess, seize, and dispose. These two sections were both in 
the Dash 1 amendments to Senate Bill 844. They do not grant any kind of authority to regulate marijuana items. They merely um, clarify that if there is, that the Oregon Liquor Control Commission or any other state officer, board, commission, corporation, et cetera, that has been granted underneath the statutory laws of the state some sort of regulatory authority, it grants them the authority underneath these sections to uh, basically uh, handle the marijuana items um, with re underneath Oregon law. Again, the language has been largely unchanged. Most of the changes are in the next section, regulation of licensees. Although in section five, we did not change anything except we went ahead and did some form and style changes and clarified some language around secured party. I believe the only reason I put uh, an amendment to section 25 in this section, even though there's no substantive changes here, is to try to keep all the licensee provisions together. So section six is the first, section six again, um, the only language in here that we have included is on page 12. It's from a previous Senate bill and it's, ba it's basically lines three to six on page 12 clarifying that a licensed premises may receive marijuana items only from a marijuana producer, processor, or wholesaler. And the intent there is to just clarify that this is a closed system and there's not going to be uh, there's not going to be product going from one system into the other system. Um, so not only can they only sell to a uh, not only can a producer, processor, or wholesaler sell to another licensee, they can also only receive from a licensee under Measure 91. Section 27, uh, Section 7. The change there is on page 13, lines 4 to 9, where we have eliminated the um, we've eliminated the specific denotions of what the licenses are going to cost and the application fees are going to be, and that'll come up in a little bit. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, when you're walking through the bill, it, I think it would be great to, uh, help to people in the room who don't have a copy of the bill in front of them or who might be listening um, if you could try to describe things. Um, you know, so that they have a rough sense of what you're uh, saying in addition to the, the, our ability to track it. So if you could just kind of make it a little bit more um, easy to discern for an outsider, that would be great. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in Section 7, which is the ba it's Section 28 of Measure 91, which is the basic provision relating to making an application for becoming a licensee. Uh, subsections 4 and 5 denoted specific fee amounts for application and licensure fees. And what we've done is we have eliminated those sections here and we have included language allowing fees to be set by rule uh, in other sections, which I will discuss in a moment. Is that better, Chair? Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, section 8 which is a general provision relating to the Commission's ability to refuse licenses to applicants, initial applicants. We did not change the substance of this section at all with the exception of there was a provision that allowed the Commission to determine whether or not there were sufficient licensed premises in certain localities. And we removed that language on the basis that there are going to be some other control mechanisms for controlling how much plants or canopy size or location of retail uh, stores that are going to come up later in the bill. And the idea was that this language ran contrary to some of those other provisions that I'll discuss later. Uh, the language could be reinstated. It doesn't necessarily conflict with them, but um, there are other mechanisms for controlling size and locality that we'll see as I move through these sections. Section 9 of the amendment deals with the Commission's ability to revoke or suspend licenses. And again, we have largely left this section unchanged. 
There is some language eliminated at the end of the section regarding civil penalties. Um, we have created later in the bill civil penalty powers using standard boilerplate, which I will cover when we get to that part. So I think really the, the major, the first major change that this committee, oh, section 10, excuse me, brand new bold face section, uh, is standard boilerplate language. The committee has seen this language before relating to the commission being able to require fingerprints for individuals uh, who make an application to the commission for licensure. Section eight, section 11 of the amendment. Again, this was language that the committee saw with Senate Bill 844-1. There is, we did a quite a bit of cleanup in here, and I think that the primary thing that we did in this section, substantively, is we, is we removed the reference to a date, and we moved that reference to a temporary section so that when we codify this, we don't have a date past the time that that date occurs in permanent law. But the substance of the, uh, the substance of that provision on or before January 4th, the Oregon <coughs> Liquor Control Commission shall uh, issue applications. It is picked up in a temporary provision, which is at the end of the bill. So. It's not that we've removed that actual substantive mandate that they do this on or before January 4th. It's that we've merely moved it to a temporary section so it does not become part of the permanent law. License holders. This is where most of the substantive provisions that the committee as a whole hasn't seen yet and the public as a whole hasn't seen yet come into play. Um, license holders, as you know, are the producers, the processors, the wholesalers, and the retailers. And it was easier to handle these separately as there were slight distinctions between what was asked to include in licensing each of these different types of license holders. Although the language is fairly similar throughout each of the provisions. Um, I will go ahead and walk through section 12, which is production of marijuana. We merely link it to section 20. This is on page 17. The first thing that we spell out is that if you're going to hold a license to produce marijuana, you have to make an application as specified in section 28, which we've already looked at. We've included language that you provide proof that each individual listed on an application has been a resident of the state for two or more years and is 21 years of age or older. And that's tracking the language that we used in the OMMA rewrite bill, and then also must meet requirements of rules adopted by the commission under section three. And then we direct the commission to adopt rules that, one, require a producer to renew the license annually. And this is building off of a, another request, technical fix request uh, by the commission, but we handled a little bit differently in the Dash 1 amendments to Senate Bill 844. Here we just uh, based it off of some of the language that was in the OMMA rewrite bill. Um, establish application licensure and renewal of licensure fees for marijuana producers and require marijuana produced by marijuana producers to be tested to ensure the public health and safety. Require marijuana producers to submit a report describing the applicant's expected energy and water usage for the upcoming year and impose any other standard on the operation of marijuana producers that ensures the public health and safety. Um, and so, again, not trying to change fundamentally the structure there, but just to um, spell out a little bit of what the committee and what the commission asked for. Um, annual renewal, adoption of fees, um, make sure it's tested, public health and safety rules, and then also the uh, report describing expected energy and water usage. We do direct at the bottom of page 17, and this language is picked up in each of these sections as well, that the commission may adopt rules that establish merit-based criteria in awarding licenses, and those include 
provision of training, apprenticeship opportunities, and living wages and benefits offered to employees. But they're not limited to those things either underneath this section. So the commission may consider those things in awarding licenses. Subsection 5. I'm sure. Yes, uh, Senator Brzezanski. Mark, regarding that, it almost sounds like, are we... Uh, are you under the impression that we may be limiting the number of licenses that can be issued in the state? For subsection 4 on that? Yes. I would regard that as preferential treatment for uh, license holders who submit information demonstrating that they are going to be a functional and um, a functional business that is able to provide for these different things, okay. but not necessarily a limitation on the licenses. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, page 18, we do direct the commission to consult with the Department of Energy in adopting rules for the submission of reports regarding water and energy usage. And then finally, in subsection 6, we, the bill specifically states that fees adopted underneath this section may not exceed the cost of administering sections 3 to 70, Chapter 1, Oregon Laws 2015, with respect to marijuana producers. And I think it's important to point out that the language is a little bit different than what we generally draft in our office when we create a fee program. Generally, we draft fees reasonably calculated to pay for the costs. Here, the language is different, says to not exceed, so the commission can uh, go under the cost if they choose to do so, and um, I think that that is something that is up for consideration. Um, and that is the standard language that we've kind of dumped into each of these with slight deviations. I'll point out those slight deviations as we go through each of these license holders. Section 13 continues to build on the regulation of marijuana producers. Um, I would consider this language to be largely a placeholder section as I think that there's still some debate out there as to how this language is eventually going to look. The idea is to restrict the size of premises for which a license has been issued um, for the first, second, and potentially third year of licensure so that there is a good actor um, system, smaller premises, smaller business operations, and then as you are uh, neither suspended or revoked or underneath any kind of disciplinary action, the size of your canopy or your growth site can change. The way that this is drafted right now, we have left blanks. Um, so first off, it's important that we specify that indoor grows will be limited by canopy size, square feet. <coughs> outdoor grows will be limited by the number of mature marijuana plants. But we haven't filled in those blanks yet because I think there's still some debate as to what the blanks will be, uh, what, what, what eventually will go into those blanks. Um, we've also included some standard language that would work legally but we might want to continue to build off of specific legislatively directed tiers for subsequent licensing years. But in subsection 3, what we've written for the time being is that the commission may adopt rules to provide for an increase in the size of the premises of either the indoor grows or the outdoor grows for subsequent years of licensure. So right now it's a permissive um, act by the commission to go ahead and provide for an increase. We do specify in subsection 4 that the commission shall continue to impose restrictions, meaning the premises restrictions, during subsequent years of licensure if the commission determines that there's a lack of market demand for any associated increase in the availability of marijuana items. So if the market just isn't there, the commission is directed to go ahead and keep the tier at the current cap. Um, so I think the idea here is that the commission look at what the market availability is and what the demand is, and as that demand increases, go ahead and allow the tier system to kick up to the next tier and award the, the good actors in that system. Um, again, I think largely this is a placeholder at this time. There's been a lot of ideas around this, um, but what we've done here is we've drafted something that would work legally and just give people something to respond to.
So section 14, uh, marijuana processors. Again, we go ahead and we specify that they must make application as provided in section 28 of the act. They must meet rules adopted by the commission under subsection three and provide proof that each individual listed on an application has been a resident of the state for two or more years and is 21 years of age or older. So the same three stipulations there. And then under sub subsection three, directing the commission to adopt rules requiring annual renewal, adoption of fees, making sure that processed marijuana items are tested and finally, a kind of catch-all public health and safety standards requirement. Um, and then we specifically tie that into the type, the different types of marijuana products that might be um, uh, processed. Edibles, concentrates, extracts, and other types of cannabinoid products identified by the commission by rule. Uh, hopefully to allow the commission to uh, have the legislative direction to adopt rules for different types of products. Again, the language about adopting merit-based criteria and limiting fees so that they may not exceed the cost of administering the act with respect to marijuana processors. So again, the marijuana processors, producers, wholesalers, they should only be on the hook for paying things that um, uh, are a cost to the commission in the way of regulating those specific licensed entities. Section 15 is the same for wholesalers. And again, there's no special deviation here from uh, unlike the other two. This is basically lays out the most basic of uh, frameworks for this, where we have make application. Um, each person must be a resident of the state for two or more years and 21 years of age or older and meet those requirements adopted by the commission by rule. Annual renewal, fees, require marijuana items received, kept, stored, or delivered by a marijuana wholesaler to be tested, and finally impose any standard. And again, I want to clarify this to be tested language is not intended to mean that the testing is going to occur at each stage. Uh, the to be tested is to allow the commission some leeway that if it is determined that the testing is uh, handled better upstream or that it happens once at the producer stage, it doesn't have to happen again. It just has to, to be tested at any point. Um, Merit-based criteria language is there as well as the cap on the fees, may not exceed the cost of administering the act. And then finally in section 16, we do retailers. I won't walk through everything again, but I do want to point out that there is a special provision here on may not be located within 1,000 feet of a school, the same language from the dispensary provision in the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act. And just as we have done with the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act and Senate Bill 936, we have a, uh, the same grandfather clause here in Section 17, which would allow uh, a dispensary, or excuse me, in this case, a retail location to continue to exist if a school is established after the retail location opens. But we won't have the same problem as we had with the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act here. Senator Prezant. Just for clarification, when you said 936, meaning 964? Correct, sorry. Thank you. So that is, those are probably the major portions of this to look at that people haven't seen before, are those sections and what those sections are attempting to do. Um, I will point out that the 1,000 feet within a school rule is only pertains to the retail locations and the energy usage plan only pertains to the processors, or the producers, excuse me. Section 18 of the bill, segregated premises. This was language that we have modified slightly from what the commission requested for the Dash 1 amendments to Senate Bill 844. And again, the idea here is that the commission should have the ability, if there is a uh, duly licensed or a, a, a 
an establishment of premises that has more than two or three licenses, whatever, that they may segregate those premises into the different operations so that if they're going to be doing both edibles and concentrates or they're going to be both selling at retail and uh, keeping a warehouse on the same premises that the commission can direct them to segregate those premises and handle their operations separately. Section 19 and 20 of the bill is probably the last thing that I worked with uh, Mr. Tom Burns on, the marijuana handlers. Um, this language hasn't been looked at by uh, a lot of people, so it's probably new to the, some of the members of the committee as well as to the public. The intent here is to require people who work in retail locations to obtain some sort of minimal uh, certification for being able to work in a store. I do want to mention that this is a provision that is of great interest for the for people who work in concentrates and edibles and if the committee desires it we can write a similar provision for people who work at uh, processing facilities as well. So it would just require a little bit of modification. Um, I won't go into great detail on that, on those sections there. If you flip to page 26, sections 21 and 22, these were also included in Senate Bill 844-1 and they are largely unchanged. Section 21 requires all licensed premises to maintain on file with the Commission a bond with a corporate surety authorized to transact business in the state and the bond is going to be in an amount that the commission determines is acceptable and the purpose of the bond is to pay for civil penalties, taxes, or um, other monies owed to the commission or to other agencies uh, if one of these premises fails to do that. Section 22 also has remained largely unchanged from Senate Bill 844-1 amendments. This requires retail sellers to carry insurance, liability insurance, or a bond in an amount of $300,000 or more uh, for purposes of <clears throat> for purposes of mitigating liability that may be incurred by the retail location in the event that uh, there is a cause of action brought against them because they sold an, a marijuana item and the consumer uh, uh, used it in a fashion that allows them to file a cause of action against them. So it's, it's actually for the protection. I think that the thing that was the most contentious during the hearing in Senate Bill 844-1 amendments was the actual amount and we have not, our office did not receive any uh, uh, information on the amount of $300,000 so um, that is what we left in this current draft but I think it might be something that just going to draw your attention to to revisit. Section 23, the seed to sale tracking system. Again the, this was from Senate Bill 844-1 and the commission asked for specific legislative authority to develop and maintain a system for tracking marijuana items offered for retail sale in the state and that we include language that will allow them to impose the tracking at the production stage and to follow the production of marijuana items all the way through the distribution chain up to the point at which uh, an end consumer purchases the product. The language also directs them to keep and maintain a database of information acquired pursuant to the Act, so they'll be keeping track of all this information. Section 24, identification requirement, was another technical fisc fix asked for by the Commission. Senate Bill 844-1. And I think that the primary substantive change here is on page 29, subsection 2. This, this provision uh, allows, this, this provision requires uh, retail licensees 
and other licensees before handing marijuana items off to basically verify age, to look at a piece of uh, verification, a person's passport or driver's license or some other identification uh, in order to check age and identification. And the commission asked for rulemaking ability to exempt uh, a licensee or a licensee representative from uh, the provisions of this section. Section 25 through Section 28. These are all provisions that were included for basically for protection of persons under 21 years of age. Some of them amend Measure 91, some of them amend other provisions of law. I think the most important provision to look at here is section 26 on page 30. This is the age verification scanner language that we looked at in the previous uh, version of Senate Bill 844-1. If you remember, that provision required, or that provision required, the, uh, that provision allowed the commission to require a retailer to use an age verification scanner to ensure that somebody who's purchasing a marijuana item is of legal age. We did include some new language this time around that I'll go ahead and read out loud. The commission may not retain any information un uh, obtained under this section after verifying a person's age, and the commission may not use any information obtained under this section for any purpose other than verifying a purpose person's age. So the intent there is to direct the commission that the minute that the uh, age verification is complete, then that information is uh, not kept, not stored or maintained, and it's not used for any other purpose. It's just verify the age and then allow the person to purchase the product. Sections 27 and 28 actually amend other provisions of law. And the idea here is to just adjust uh, laws that currently pertain to alcohol beverages by minors so that they equally apply to marijuana items by persons 21 years of age and under. Um, I don't think that there's much contention on that, and that language has remained largely unchanged from Senate Bill 844-1 amendments. The next major section is enforcement. Page 32, <coughs> section 29. This is the standard boilerplate civil penalty language that we include with most of the bills that we write nowadays. In addition to any other liability or penalty provided by law, the commission may impose for each violation of a provision of the act of Measure 91, a civil penalty that does not exceed $5,000 for each day that the violation occurs. The commission shall impose civil penalties under this section in the manner provided by ORS 183-745, and then the monies collected will go into the fund that we've established in this act to help pay for administering the act. I want to mention here real quickly that as I'm reading this right now, I see a couple things that stand out. One is there's inconsistency here between a $5,000 civil dollar penalty that we're allowing here and the $500 one that we wrote into the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act. And then the second thing is that probably this should be oriented specifically toward licensees and licensee representatives, which would be a drafting error on my part. Those both sound like good changes to me. Section 30, again, this was from Senate Bill 844-1. It's the language about marijuana enforcement inspectors. And basically, this provision allows the commission to use uh, enforcement inspectors, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, who would have certain powers related to the criminal statutes in this stage, in this state, excuse me, to conduct inspections and investigations, make arrests and seizures, aid in prosecutions for offenses, issue citations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for purposes related to regulating, prohibit, pr and regulating or prohibiting activities related to marijuana items. The language is largely copied from the uh, Oregon Liquor Control Act statutes, although we have updated it, of course, 
so that it would reflect marijuana items instead. Um, again, the language is largely unchanged from those Dash 1 amendments, and it does track uh, the Liquor Control Act statute fairly closely, I believe. We did add, however, uh, subsection 3, and I'll just read it out loud. A marijuana enforcer inspector may not conduct inspections and investigations for purposes of ensuring compliance with ORS 475-300 to 475-346. That's the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act, and um, the, the provision probably would not allow that anyway. This is really clarification language just to clarify that these inspectors are not going to be used for conducting inspections and investigations uh, with respect to the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, could we also make it clear, because I think it will help ease some people's concerns, that they will not be doing inspections related to home grows, only licensees, right? That would make s underneath Section 6 of Measure 91, correct? Um, I guess just overall that OLCC personnel will not be doing any inspections related to home grows just as to licensee compliance. That would make sense. Great. Yeah, and I can write that in. Um, section 31 is, again, it's fairly standard boilerplate relating to subpoenas and it was requested by the Commission for the Dash 1 Amendments to Senate Bill 844, and that language is largely unchanged. Basically allows the Commission to, um, for purposes of this particular act, the provisions of ORS 183-440 apply to subpoenas issued by the Commission and any authorized agent of the Commission ties it into our normal subpoena processes so that we don't have to basically reinvent the wheel there. Um, section 32, this is the fund that we have created for the Commission where all the fee monies and civil penalty monies will be placed. And it's standard boilerplate, and we've, and we've basically written in that standard language that monies in the fund are continuously appropriated to the Commission to administer in four sections, 3 to 70, Chapter 1, Oregon Laws, 2015. And hopefully the idea here is that eventually the licensees will be paying for the program once it gets up and running and it doesn't cost as much, and that the tax revenues will all be going into the distribution uh, uh, account where the distributions are going to be made for, the vari for various purposes. The next several sections are, prob along with the licensee sections that we covered earlier, the producer, processor, wholesaler, and retailer sections, the next sections are also probably the ones that are uh, the most different from what anybody has seen at this point and the ones that um, we kind of deviated the most from Measure 91 itself, um, accepting the technical fix bill that we had, uh, amendments that we looked at earlier. So Section 33, we updated the preemption language in Measure 91 to use our standard boilerplate at this point except as expressly authorized by the statutory laws of this state, the authority to regulate marijuana items and the production, processing, and sale of marijuana items, and the authority to impose a tax or fee on the production, processing, or sale of marijuana items is vested solely in the legislative assembly. And the idea there is it's not going to necessarily curtail city or county ordinances from doing this, but there would have to be some sort of statutory authority for cities and counties to do it. On page 34, section 34, we have used the language from the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act for the reasonable regulations language revolving around the reasonable time, place, and manner regulations. So again here, the idea is to try to remain consistent between the two acts and to create some sort of clarification and uniformity between how the two acts will be applied. Mr. Mayor, can I jump in? Um, yes. So since, since uh, the ability of local jurisdictions to regulate things has been a, something on the top of people's minds Correct. in the last couple of weeks, I just want to be clear that um, it's, it's my um, belief that the language that you have here um, is totally, uh, well, I guess the, the 
it's consistent with all of the Measure 91 things because those are as to opting out. This just says that local jurisdictions would not impose um, additional inconsistent with these land use laws um, rules. Is that right? That is correct, yeah. Chair Leininger. Thanks. Yes. So for Section 34, we have used the same language that we used in the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act. Um, reasonable limitations on the hours during which a retailer uh, may operate, conditions on the manner in which a retailer may sell marijuana items, reasonable requirements related to a public's access to a premises for which a license has been issued, reasonable limitations on where a premises for which a license has been issued may be located, um, and then I think that we might have a little bit of a cleanup in 936 a little bit later. Excuse me, subsection 2 is the actual, on page 35, actually spells out that the governing body of a city or county may adopt ordinances that impose reg reasonable regulations on the operation of businesses located at a premises for which a license has been issued. So there's the definition portion which talks about what these reasonable regulations are and then the authority granted to the cities and counties to enact ordinances. And then we have another line in here, which might be another cleanup for 930, uh, 964, excuse me. Uh, regulations adopted under this section must be consistent with city and county comprehensive plans, zoning ordinances, and applicable provisions of public health and safety, um, just to ensure that there is a consistent approach to how all these different regulations are adopted. Section 35. This language was in the Dash 5 amendments to Senate Bill 844, which uh, caused a bit of stir for the committee earlier. Um, and Representative Helm and I have worked on this language in an attempt to address those concerns. I think I might just walk through them at this point uh, to uh, demonstrate how uh, we've attempted to uh, modify the language in order to address the committee's earlier concerns. Um, so the first thing is, is we specify that marijuana is a crop for certain agricultural purposes. And in the original Dash 5 amendments, we only tied it into farm use as defined in ORS 215-203. Here we also tie it into other various agricultural specific provisions. Uh, it's a crop for purposes of farming practice as defined in ORS 3930. It's a product of farm use as described in ORS 308A62 and a product of agricultural activity as described in ORS 568909. And I would love to be able to elaborate on each of those, but um, I believe Representative Helm would be a much better source of information for that. Um, the primary dwelling language is fairly intact from the last draft. What we did do is we changed the language in what is now subsection 3, which is the processing language, which originally there was a mandate uh, for counties to, uh, in, to treat this the same as the extent to which it's provided for other crops underneath the land use statutes. And here we've kind of flipped it and made it more of a permissive uh, uh, permissive read. The processing of marijuana leaves or flowers on a premises that is located on exclusive farm use land and for which a license has been issued under Section 20 is permissible to the extent that it is provided for other crops under ORS 215.213 sub 2 or 215.283 sub 2. And for the purposes of processing marijuana on lands outside urban growth boundaries, a county may allow marijuana processing through a home occupation permit that is consistent with the county's zoning ordinances. So we've made that second part of that uh, permissive as opposed to a mandatory home occupation permit provision. The tie-in to the Oregon Liquor Control Commission requesting a land use combat compatibility statement has remained so that the commission will be aware of what the land use provisions are for purposes of issuing licenses. <coughs> but the language that was tacked on to the end of this provision about a uh, county having to amend its comprehensive land use zone has been dropped from this draft. So there will be no Luba Axel 
uh, problem in this particular draft anymore. Um, that is the substantive changes to Measure 91. Um, are there any questions on those? I know there's a lot. I, if you look at them all, I do believe that mo about two thirds of them have still are still technical fixes from the Dash One amendments, um, or other things that we've seen and have worked on throughout this entire process. So I've been working with different members on different pieces of this, and hopefully we've got it up to where it's almost a complete product. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Mark, thank you for all the work on this. It's it's really quite. Uh, Extensive. I, I've got several questions, Madam Chair. If it's okay to, to go through a couple different sections, just get some clarification. Yes. Um, sections 22, 21, and 22. Mark, you talked about. We talked about this before when it came up. Um, are we certain that bonds and insurance will be available to uh, companies that are in the marijuana industry? And if if it does not turn out that uh, there are bonding or insurance sources. Uh, do we have a way to have the commission uh, adopt to that reality? Uh, Chair Leininger, Representative Buckley, I believe that it would be wise to include an exemption for that very purpose given the banking issues that we, that we are faced with. So, yeah, I think that that would need to be exemption language that we include. Great. So in a, a change? There, would, there needs to be a change there, Thank I agree. You. Uh, yes, I think, uh, did you want to continue Happy your question? All right, uh, Senator well, it, It's a question related to that comment, Great. To, to the issue. So, you know, I, I've been wondering about the very question about a, the availability of surety bonds and performance bonds. Um, and if we do a, a, a straight waiver, uh, I don't think we accomplish protecting uh, the state's interests as we would need to. So. If, if I might suggest that we need to discuss the possibility of a posted bond or uh, a cash bond in lieu of a bond that might be available uh, from an insurer. Uh, you, you know, I don't want to um, overburden uh, the producers, but I would hate to see that uh, we would simply provide a waiver and walk away from the issue of security. It, it's not in the interest of the uh, Department of Revenue or the state of Oregon not to have any threshold via a waiver. So maybe we would um, entertain something along the lines of a cash bond whose uh, requirements might be different significantly than the, the stated requirements for a, a surety bond that would be available at a, at a relatively low cost from an insurer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Makes, makes sense. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the other question I had was on uh, uh, on page 17, the energy and water use uh, report, basically by the license applicant. Um, th would a city such as, say, Ashland, have the ability to uh, uh, communicate with the commission and express concerns, saying we would really rather you not issue licenses to a uh, a growing operation that is going to use. Uh, the our electrical utility at a rate that is so far beyond what a normal commercial rate would be rate of use would be would the city have any ability to uh, impact that uh, that that where where the commission would set the marks or or deal with that report uh, representative Buckley I believe in I believe with this language no um, because this language really requires merely a report describing water and energy usage uh, for purposes of the upcoming year. Um, may I talk about the, uh, my understanding was that we really, that, that it's desirable to have this information on hand for a work group that's going to be addressing this issue more thoroughly or to maybe replace it with, uh, if time allows in this session, replace it with language relating to energy usage plan. Um, but right now the language merely requires a report detailing what their energy and water usage is going to be for the upcoming year. So we would have to address that through amendment or in a future session if desired. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Senator Cruz. Just follow up on Representative Buckley because you talk about water use. I mean, uh, you know, you get into water rights and you get into allocations. I mean, are, are we are we delving into that at all in this? Or, you know, they can have a plan 
and then the water's not there. So, I mean, are, are we, are, I guess I would say, are we giving them a seat at the table higher than existing uses in any way, shape, or form? Uh, Senator Cruz, I know any other generally applicable law would pertain to marijuana licensees the same as it would apply to anybody else. So they're not getting an elevated stance. I, this language is merely to uh, basically start collecting data related to water use and energy use for purposes of attempting to uh, hopefully create further legislation down the road if those usage marks are much higher than expected or for other similar types of operations. I guess, Madam Chair, I'm just looking at it. It's a, whether it's an indoor or outdoor. It's an ag. It's an ag product. It's an ag application, and the, the availability of water would be the same as it is for any other agriculture. I know, like myself, for example, we're purchasing some more reserve this year because we're going to have a drought. You know that sort of thing. You know, and we have water rights and things like that. So I'm just, I just want to make sure we're not messing with the current system. Thank you, Senator. No, and so I think that my office has been one pushing this on behalf of uh, my city, asking for at least some attention to it. The city of Arcata, California, experienced uh, such a uh, an increase in indoor grows that uh, they had significant problems with utility uh, uses in their in their community, and ended up adopting an ordinance that actually increased the price of uh, utility use at, at a certain point to try to, to mitigate that impact that they were having. So we're, we're not trying to, uh, to change the current system. We're just trying to uh, at least have a path forward to mitigate ext uh, extreme energy use uh, should that uh, be a component of indoor growing. Well, and I, I appreciate that, Representative. I, I guess I'm just looking at the fact that um, two-thirds of the counties in the state are already um, under drought, drought conditions, yeah. and we will all be there before the summer's over. So, um, I think that's a great point. I think uh, I remember when PGE came and talked to us about that's energy great. use for indoor grows, and they noted how beneficial it would be if they could know in advance if someone was going to start up a significant indoor grow. So, I think you know, even setting aside the constituent request that you're responding to as part of this work, I think it'll be useful to to have people kind of think through how much electricity they're going to need to do their grows so that the service providers can be making plans to accommodate that. But but plenty of opportunity to um, modify or give input on this. So thanks for registering those thoughts. Do you have more in your string of? Um, I have some, when we're Bob, done, I have some thoughts on, on some next steps. But So we had... Um, Representative Olson had been working on some great reclassification of crimes, and we have some taxation elements. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's something that you're moving to next, or if we're... If we're I could cover those. Would, would you mind just kind of yeah. quickly walking us through? Thanks. Um, the, a lot of the other provisions the committee is seeing... Uh, sorry, Chair Leininger. A lot of the other provisions the committee has seen before, or they're largely boilerplate or template language, so I don't have to, like, walk through okay. each one of them. Um, the next major portion of the bill is the point of sale taxation, which begins on page 52. And th this section is largely based on a template that our office has developed and our fine deputy, Catherine Toswell, has developed for purposes of creating point of sale taxation uh, uh, provisions for other types of items. Um, I think that the first one that we that this body passed was uh, related to disposable cell phones. I can't remember exactly, but it's it's a template that works, and I can show you a specific provision that'll show you exactly how well it ties into uh, current Department of Revenue uh, processes. Uh, the other thing that should be noted is that this language has already been looked at, at the by the Department of Revenue, so the, the agency's looked at it. We've worked with the agency through um, uh, the now absent uh, Chair Burdick. I think uh, most people know that this is something that she's been working on. The important thing to look at is Section 70, which is on page 53. This is the mandate. The tax is hereby imposed upon retail sale of marijuana items in this state. The tax shall be collected at the point of sale of a marijuana item by a marijuana retailer at the time at which the sale occurs. And then the tax imposed under this section shall be imposed at the rate of 
and we have specifically left the rates for the different uh, types of marijuana products here blank. Um, I believe that uh, LRO, Legislative Revenue Office, is working on this and the idea is to come back with numbers that would impose a tax that would result in substantially the same revenue or you know the same revenue as what was projected for the original measure 91 um, so that's what we're that's what we're waiting on right now so I want to make sure that people understand uh, who may be listening in because we're inviting your feedback on this we got a fair amount of feedback that having the tax imposed at a point of sale instead of um, at the point of harvest would be uh, welcomed by people in the industry is more efficient and easy to deal with and so co-chair Burdick went forth and tried to flesh out what that would look like but I think out of respect for the the tax rates in the um, in measure 91 the desire as I understand it is to cleave to those to not depart from those tax rates but to figure out a way to memorialize it in this new you know point of sale taxation method um, and their and Department of Revenue is still figuring out exactly how you translate that so it's the same thing but applied in this point of sale way so feel free to give us your input on this if you like it and you feel good that we're trying to explore something in response to community input great if uh, it makes you really anxious or frustrated let us know you know we want to hear from you just a few things I want to point out throughout this template. Uh, section 72 on page 55, we've modified the template to specifically allow the Oregon Liquor Control Commission to enter into an agreement with the Department of Revenue for the purposes of administrating these acts so that they can kind of divvy up, you know, what the, the different um, duties, functions, and powers will be. Uh, the Department of Revenue is certainly going to be the driver here if this portion of this uh, bill or this amendment to a bill uh, were to be enacted into law. But uh, the commission still has a role to play, and there will be a memorandum of understanding between the two in order to uh, assist the department in the duties, functions, and powers of collecting the tax. So we have included that language. The language that is probably the most helpful to understand is on page, let me see here, I've lost it, uh, pay, uh, page 57, section 77, I believe. Apologies, that was not the right section. What I wanted to address is that we have a provision in this template that basically ties the Department of Revenue processes into all their existing processes for collecting taxes and for procedures related to taxes. I've lost the language right now, I apologize. But the idea is that we're not going to reinvent the wheel here. We basically connect it with ORS chapters 315, 316, and 317 and allow the department to use all of its existing powers uh, as it sees fit. Uh, not necessarily requiring them, but as it sees fit in order for taxation collection purposes. Um, that's why the template works really well for this purpose. And um, a lot of the comments for the for Senate Bill 844-1, if I remember correctly, were around the taxation issue and hopefully working through some of those issues as to how is this going to be implemented, how is it going to look, should the, depart, uh, should the commission have these powers or not. Uh, the template resolves a lot of these problems right from the get-go. Um, one of the things that I do want to mention real quickly before I move on is that this is probably the only portion of this amendment that will take me time to amend. If we decide to take it out, go back to the tonnage tax, that will take me time to amend. The rest of the amendment, this dash one amendment, has been constructed so that I can amend it very quickly and amend it uh, basically on the fly and be very responsive to you. So if this is something that comes out, it will take me time to go through it, just so you know. Um, Senator Pazanski and then Senator Ferrioli. Uh, th <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, regarding the uh, shift to a point of sales tax, I do believe this is appropriate after giving uh, much consideration. It seems to me that we need to have a flexibility with what the market pricing is of the products. 
uh, when we look at what was in 91, if you take, uh, let's just say, an ounce of marijuana uh, uh, flowers is going for $100, at $35 an ounce, that's a 35% tax. That's almost the same amount as what Washington State is, is 40. And clearly, if we're going to make the inroads that we want to against the black market, we need to have much more flexibility. So when the price changes, it's not going to be, uh, let's say, uh, inducive for the black market to be able to undercut the state. Uh, thank you, ma'am. <coughs> the only question I have is a, one of simply a, a practicality question. If I understand, and I probably don't very well, the OLCC model for collecting point of sale taxes, the OLCC agent takes a, does an inventory report, a daily sales report, and then does a daily deposit. And that uh, keeps the OLCC current on what is being sold, which specific items of the inventory that are being sold. Uh, and uh, there's a penny for penny accounting of the tax dollars that would then be transferred electronically to the state of Oregon. I assume that's the model that we're contemplating here. So, the, you know, the question that I keep bumping up against is that uh, the OLCC agent has access to the banking system and electronic transfers. It is not enjoined in any way um, by the money laundering statutes. So if we've used that model, are we absolutely, positively, without question, certain that the uh, marijuana retailer can use the system that accesses the federal banking system for wire transfers to the Department of Revenue? Simple question, big implications. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, did you so, uh, did you want to take that? Uh, we did issue an opinion on this uh, earlier this week. Uh, we've been researching the issue. There is a general exemption in the Controlled Substances Act for purposes of states um, having, basically being able to regulate monies related to controlled substances. I actually don't have the opinion with me, and I probably should, so I could read from it. I would be happy to... Uh, return to that issue for the ch uh, for the committee itself, uh, procure that opinion for you so that you guys would have it on hand that addresses that specific question. And Madam Chairman, the, uh, the correct answer to that question is yes. We're absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. And if, we, if, that is, if there's any other answer to that question, then we need to sort of retool uh, the, the whole revenue assumption that we're making. Here. Thank you. Madam I think that's that makes sense. So I have Senator Przanski and then uh, Senator Byer. Did you have a nope. hand up, Senator Cruz? Did you? I did. The Controlled so. Substances Act covers Schedule One as well. Uh, yeah, Schedule okay. One is part of the Controlled okay. Substances Act. Okay. So I'm wondering if we could just follow up on what Senator Ferrioli asked about the model that's being used. I know that there's been some discussion about the model that retailers are using for these uh, uh, cell phones, uh, I guess disposable cell phones. Is it the sa same model or is it a different model? I'm just curious as to do we have ones to pick from so if the answer isn't yes, whether there's another way to uh, get to that same uh, result that we want. As Senator Przanski, I'm sure that there would be if it, if it was a problem, um, but Again, our office has been looking at the issue, and we're certain that this is not going to be an issue. Okay. Madam so. Chair, just follow up. Okay. Somebody in Washington State and somebody in Colorado has already answered this question. Mm -hmm. They would have had to in order, in order to accept their tax payments. I just want to make sure that detail is part of the record and clearly articulated. Okay, great. Um, all right, so, and, and of course, this is our introductory conversation about this, and there'll be an opportunity. I'm glad you're flagging those issues so that we can get definitive um, word back, but it sounds like we actually do have definitive word from our, our council. And Madam Chair, we can talk about it more. might be so bold. Yeah. The uh, same question will have to be answered for uh, municipalities who have property taxes, for counties who would assess property taxes, and other uh, jurisdictions w w that are subdivisions of the state of Oregon. 
right. so that there won't be a question about whether or not an individual grower or other licensee uh, can present uh, proceeds from this activity to pay their property taxes, their income taxes, their right. city and county taxes. And Thank as you, as you know, this, um, the payment of taxes using proceeds from legal marijuana businesses has been happening in Colorado and Washington State, and so I'm sure we'll get some good guidance from that, but we'll, we'll circle back on that issue. Senator Beyer, did you have a thing? Okay, please go ahead. He's got a thing, but he doesn't have a <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> I'm just going to move on to the next major portion, and I'll uh, just address it briefly. It begins on page 72. It's the testing provision. It's the same language, again, as I discussed earlier from uh, Senate Bill 844-6 amendments. Um, probably not a lot to revisit there. Of course, it's a new amendment to a new bill, so uh, plenty of time to take a second look, I guess. But uh, this has been through the committee before, and you guys have seen the language before. The only difference here, again, is that we have removed from this any references to uh, medical marijuana processing sites. We don't know if they're going to exist in this bill or not. Um, but we do have a repealer in this bill that basically allows the testing provisions of the other two bills to control if one of them should pass. So there will be no conflict in law if one of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act bills passes and this bill passes. Uh, same statement with respect to packaging and labeling, beginning on page 80. It's the same language, largely only removing references that were created for purposes of the rewrite of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act. Otherwise, the language is exactly the same. Um, nurseries. Uh, this is uh, some. This is something that we've been working with uh, with industry, and the idea here is to create a system of uh, a system where uh, immature marijuana plants may be propagated and seeds may be breeded and basically sold or transferred into either the medical market or into the recreational market. This is also the only provision of this act that will become operative quite early, and I'll just point that out uh, early on, and I'll explain the purpose of that in a minute. There has been some discussion about, well, does this mean that, you know, a marijuana growth site underneath the Medical Marijuana Act or a producer underneath Measure 91 won't be able to propagate immature plants or breed seeds. It does not. Uh, we have specifically excluded from the provisions of the Act uh, registered marijuana growth sites, uh, producers underneath Measure 91, and because we use general language with regard to cannabis seeds as opposed to marijuana as a definition, uh, the industrial hemp growers underneath the industrial hemp statute. So they're exempted. They'll still be able to propagate immature plants. They'll still be able to breed their own seeds. Uh, but what this does is it creates a new licensing scheme specifically for purposes of feeding the medical and the recreation, recreational system by transferring into those systems or selling into those systems immature plants or seeds. The nursery statutes here, they also allow they allow the sale of seeds or the sale of immature plants to both grow sites and dispensaries underneath the Medical Marijuana Act, and they allow for the transfer of immature marijuana plants and seeds, or sale, excuse me, to both recreational stores and um, uh, recreational, recreational stores, wholesalers, and producers underneath Measure 91. So they can sell into uh, basically most of the licensed premises, the ones that make sense. Um, it follows fairly standard boilerplate language where we basically direct the commission to develop qualifications for certification, processes for applying for and renewing a certificate, and fees for applying for receiving and renewing a certificate. We also direct the commission to come up with reasonable limitations on operations necessary to control plant pests and plant diseases and protect the public health and safety, and we direct the commission and give it the authority to track the seeds using the seed and sale tracking system that it develops for purposes of 91. So they'll be able to use the uh, seed to sale here. 
The seed to cell tracking system will not be allowed to carry into the medical program if that is where they're going to be transferring or selling it. So it, it will only be for stuff that's going into the 91 system. Um, if it goes into the medical system at the point at which it's transferred, then there's a cutoff point for that. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, I'm yep. hoping that in about the next five minutes you can cover um, the research certification and crime part, yep. and then leave, uh, I think uh, Representative Buckley wanted to make a comment. If, if anyone else has any closing comments uh, before we hit the time, that would be great. Thank you. Research certification on page 90, section 119. Basically, we direct the authority along with the Commission and the Department of Agriculture to establish a program for the purpose of identifying and certifying private and public researchers of cannabis. Uh, we wrote this very broadly um, so that the authority can identify individuals, businesses, nonprofit organizations, research institutions, or public entities that are conducting research in the following areas. Uh, on the medical side, clinical research, and on the agricultural side, agricultural research. And then there are some, uh, dis there's some descriptive language there, the including language that, uh, that g provides some direction for what might constitute appropriate clinical or agricultural research. But certainly the language isn't limiting. And then we've given some directions on what type of researchers should be certified. Uh, do they have access to public or private funding? What's going to be the overall cost of the research? What's the overall benefit to uh, the cannabis industry and to public health and safety or overall knowledge of cannabis? Likelihood that the candidate's research will result in measurable quantitative or qualitative effects and legal barriers to conducting a candidate's research. We did not want to cut out public institutions such as OSU and those from the possibility of being certified underneath this section at one point. But again, uh, the direction is to take a look at is, are there specific legal barriers at this time to awarding a certificate? And that would preclude some of those public institutions from being certified currently. Um, it's a very basic section um, at this point. I'm sure we'll get some feedback on it. We'll be able to improve it. And the purpose behind it is to enable people to possess um, Correct. large amounts of marijuana so that they can do this work that they wouldn't otherwise be able legally to possess. So. Right. The, it would only be for purposes of research. They're not selling or transferring or they're basically allowed to conduct research. We do have the standard boilerplate exemption language from the criminal laws of this state there. Uh, the crimes sections, we have specifically exempted from the, I'm going to call them the school crimes, manufacturing or delivering within a thousand feet of a school. We've specifically exempted both licensee and licensee representatives from those criminal acts, as well as a person acting within the scope of and in compliance with Section 6 uh, of Measure 91, which is the home grow provision. So clear, clear statutory direction that these that what's authorized in 91 is not going to be is not going to be constitute a crime underneath the thousand feet within a school crimes with regard to manufacturing and delivering marijuana. Um, for section 122 on page 92 and section 123 on page 93, um, those are the crimes of manufacturing and delivering marijuana. The initial language that was suggested is that we reduce these crimes to Class C felonies, but there was a request by the actual requester of this amendment to go ahead and leave these blank at this time for purposes of discussion. Um, for instance, currently unlawful manufacture of marijuana is a Class B felony. Reduce it to a C felony was the original idea, but again, the actual request for this amendment did not want to presume what the committee would decide, so we went ahead and included blanks for discussion. And same thing with the delivery statutes. Uh, unlawful delivery of marijuana <coughs> is a B felony if for consideration and a C felony if for no <coughs> consideration. Again, the original idea here was uh, reduce it at least to a C felony in all instances. Um, on page 94, section 124, Specifically, lines 20 through 30, unlawful possession for persons under 21 years of age. Um, the idea here was to remove references to uh, the current statute 
unlawful possession, for instance, underneath the current statute of four ounces or more of marijuana by a person under 21 years of age is a Class C felony. And I think there's some desire to maybe for the committee to discuss if you're 20 uh, years and 360 days old and you have four ounces of marijuana at home, it's a C felony. And if you would be 10 days older, you would be scot-free. So the idea was to maybe discuss lowering those limits for persons who are under 21 years of age. Um, and then there's just some basic cleanup in here with regard to uh, the statutes. I, I do think that our office do, does need to do some more work with the possession statute as a whole. Um, it in part uses definitions currently from Measure 91 and it in part uses definitions that were incorporated during the 2013 session about uh, marijuana product in liquid and solid form. I think maybe we should just sync it all up with Measure 91 um, at this point. But So maybe a little bit of retooling there on our office's behalf. Um, conforming amendments. Uh, the retail drug outlets section on page 101, uh, this was simply uh, written for those pharmacies that are located in big box stores and uh, if there's a manager of the store who doesn't feel like he has the right to uh, deal with this type of situation. I think it, the specific situation it came from was uh, marijuana being left unattended in a big box store pharmacy and the manager uh, basically felt like in that situation he didn't have any statutory authority for being able to collect it and dispose of it properly and so we have gone ahead and written in something that would allow them to do that under state law. Um, may I interrupt you? Yeah. The expungement language we had been talking about, did, did you have a chance to incorporate that in? I know you were sprinting to finish that. Right. I did not get a chance to incorporate the expungement language. The uh, intent for this first draft was to include expungement language for at least all um, uh, for at least all possession crimes. Right, and and then that was my hope. And then I know that um, Representative Olson's really good thinking around um, reclassifying some crimes is also consistent with. Um, making them more easy to expunge. Is that right? Can you speak to that? Or Representative Olson, would you like to? When things go from a B felony to a C felony? Yeah, going forward, and this wouldn't apply to people who are currently uh, convicted of a marijuana crime, and that's where we would have to do work on the expungement. But if you do reduce it down to a C felony, um, it does allow for an easier path to expungement than for other types of yeah. felony crimes, so correct? That's right. So uh, going forward, if you are convicted, it would allow for easier expungement in all cases. Um, but I think that the expungement language that we need to work with in this particular draft is for if we want to address past crimes and people who are currently convicted. Right. Does anybody have uh, so thank you so much. Do you feel like you've been able to get through that last bit and we will have more opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you, you were able to. Oh, yeah. Got, feel you nailed great. it. You did a great job. You did <laughs> tremendous work. Um, so thank you. Um, and before we close, I wanted to offer people an opportunity to make some comments. Um, Senator Ferrioli had a hand up, and then I know Representative Buckley wanted to say something. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great work, uh, Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it lends credibility to the uh, requirement, or at least the suggestion that I made that we should get the before picture of our drafter, because after he's going to look different than he does even now. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, the uh, in previous iterations of bills, uh, I've asked for the dash one amendments to Senate Bill 750 another dash amendment to um, uh, another uh, 844, the dash fours. Uh, Madam Chair, they have all, all have to do with the same issue. That's the temporary authority for um, dispensaries to offer retail products, uh, temporary authority for dispensaries to collect taxes. Mm -hmm. So I would be requesting that amendment for the uh, 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 bill currently before us, uh, Senate Bill 3400, just 
if my staff hasn't already requested it, they're probably ahead of me already, but they haven't already requested it. They're just putting you on notice. But Madam Chair, the really important thing I want to put on the record with that regard is I do not want to hear from the Department of the OLCC that, that for whatever reason they're not aware that this will be coming, that they're not capable of doing it, that they, you know, have no staff, no uh, temporary rule uh, ready in draft form. I'm just letting them know those will not be welcome explanations. So, you know, there should be no mystery. We've been talking about this for at least 60 days, if not longer. Uh, I will expect the department to arrive at some point in the future in consideration of that amendment, uh, ready to tell me how they will implement the temporary authority for collecting taxes and limited scope retail sales at dispensaries. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And you know he means it, and if, if it doesn't happen on time, the Senate may form its own committee and move forward. <laughs> I think that uh, Representative Buckley had a comment, and then uh, Senator Przanski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, just to kind of take off from where you, you just commented, uh, you know, last week during the uh, revenue forecast, uh, there was a disruption of the committee and uh, there were several arrests made. Uh, and I was surprised to learn that there is actually in statute a law against obstruction of the legislative process. And my second thought was, wow, has the Senate ever been charged with that? Uh, <laughs> or the House could be as well. And, it, <laughs> and, and, and I'll, I'll convey this request to to Senator Burdick as well. I, mean, I hope she is feeling much better. Um, I, I think what's happened, and I'll try to be as gentle as possible with my comments is that uh, in the uh, the bill that was passed by the Senate committee today it's it's not only that you you know you took your own ball and went home uh, you took our ball too uh, we worked uh, very hard on the legislation around the medical marijuana program and when we reached a point of impasse uh, the decision was made to not only take the bill but also to move it across the Senate floor with a 10 million dollar fiscal and I would just have to just to, uh, issue my objection to that and the request I'm making uh, is that we continue to search for principled, com principled compromise in this committee. That's what a joint committee needs to do, and that's how we can get to a good result. But if, uh, if it's the goal of the Senate to, uh, to simply replay the last episode we've been through, and if the Senate does want to change the opt-out provision, Measure 91, my request would be, out of respect and courtesy, uh, that you go ahead and do that in your Senate committee, uh, to, to please don't take the time of this committee, but go ahead and do that in your committee, pass it out as a standalone bill, please take public testimony on it. I think it's really important to have public testimony on bills that impact people's lives. But I would make that request of you. If, if the desire is to do an opt-out different to Measure 91, then please put that through your Senate uh, committee and let that uh, live on its own. Please don't uh, take our ball and go home again. Please let us work on the Measure 91 bill collectively as this joint committee has been charged to do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anybody want to all of that? Well, I actually wanted to uh, say something that had nothing to do with this. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't the second <laughs> segue, <laughs> segue I was looking for, but I'll tell you, you know, from my perspective, uh, I have for one senator that's on this committee is not looking to uh, change what was put in uh, Measure 91 as to how local option works. Uh, so that's my commitment as it has been. Uh, regarding the uh, taxing, I think one of the things that we may want to look at is maybe taking Senator Ferrioli's and seeing how we can accomplish that through the Oregon Health Authority uh, instead of having OLCC engaged in it. I, I really think OLCC needs to stay home doing what they're supposed to be doing on and implementing 91 and not having a diversion because it could actually cause them to be delayed in actually getting the program up and running uh, further than they are. And I think that. Uh, uh, o o OHA will be able to uh, monitor and do what needs to be done to collect the tax and we can uh, keep OLCC focused on their primary task which is getting the program up and running and I'll talk to Senator Ferriold about some suggestions of how we might be able to do that. Great. Well, thank you everybody. So, so Wednesday we're going to have a public hearing on this bill. Um, so please uh, join us and bring your ideas. Feel free to email us in the meantime to, to let us know what you're thinking. But thank you, everyone, and thank you to this group of people. I mean, this is not an easy process, and we're going to move forward and get something good done. So good night. Meeting adjourned.